I'm, I'm hopeful that through the negotiation of, of uh, the current year's final costs, in conversations they have with Michelle, that we could work something out for the fall that we wouldn't have to increase that transportation budget. But that's all up in the air right now, so we really don't know. I just want to make sure we cover it. Well, yeah, so we do have that 500000 in that contingency that we can move over. Um, if some of it is transportation to cover that. You, you think some of the help, if something like that were to come about, wouldn't there be help from the state? Uh, I mean, newbies, a budget. I know, I know. <laughs> yeah. no. Realistically, no, but budget effect. So, Can so you I, apply for help? So if I could point one thing out, we do have uh, a grant called the CARES grant, and that's $492,000 that we bought. We can use in this year and next year, full, specifically for pandemic-related expenditures. Uh, some of the things they talk about are technology needs, uh, needs for professional services to help us navigate this. And if we had increased transportation costs because of that, we could apply some of that money to the, the bill. Um, Brian brings up a good point, though. Whether we have the money or not, do we have capacity within the budget to pick up that extra expense? Because we, we can't overspend the budget unless we open it up and re- uh, go on it. So with that $500,000 contingency, we would move some of that into transportation to cover it, but we would use revenue from the CARES grant to help fund it. Is the 492 CARES Act revenue reflected in the total revenue now? It is not reflected in the total revenue for two reasons. One, um, it covers a two-year period. And when we get to the item down here about the uh, Chrome ad purchases, we're using half of it for technology needs to ensure that everyone has the technology they need to continue online stuff. And if we have to, you know, keep, keep that going in the fall, then then technology wise we're okay. So out of that four hundred and ninety some thousand, we believe half of that's gonna be used in this year. Um, I don't know what's going to happen with PPP needs. Um, we don't know what's going to happen with professional services, but it's possible that we could um, pay for something by the end of June, and then we would uh, report all that revenue in this year. If we report the revenue next year, it's going to be an extra 200000 That's not in the budget budgeted revenues, though. So there are two items not in the budgeted revenues. CARES revenue, and then we have another grant, um, a safety grant of about 285000 that we haven't confirmed yet, but that'll be additional revenue that we get. Uh, again, that's going to be, I believe it's going to be multiple years. So we could show that, but I have a feeling we're going to have to show additional expenses. We yeah. don't know what they're what It's going to be on. one, it's going to be in one and in the other. Right. So yeah. it's what we have here with the budget. If we have more costs, we've got to. Right. So we've got to. We have the revenue. Exactly. Yeah. So, if, so if we'd added it, I would have assumed it. Well, then let's we'll add more to contingency to cover that. But I don't necessarily think that I don't think that's necessary. Yeah. 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 Um, also, on the pages that I handed out, uh, these, these will be the summary pages that I go over next Monday. Um, if you go to page five. That is the median homestead property change in bills um, and tax bill. Um, I have the new median assessment for Chester County and Lancaster County. We discussed those um, at the beginning of the month. So with no, with a zero percent tax increase, we would only rebalance, and rebalancing would increase the bills for Chester County, and decrease the bills for Lancaster County. And you can see on that uh, report. That anyone who has a median assessment in Chester County want a thirteen dollar increase, and anyone with a median assessment of one ninety one in Lancaster want a twenty one dollar decrease. So this is rebalancing only. It's you know we can say we have a zero percent tax increase, just that this rebalancing may affect your tax bill slightly. And then some good news if you look at page six. 
that's the Hempstead Farmstead reduction. So last month I reported that we were going to get all the revenue. A couple of days later, we were all informed that hey, you're not going to get your revenue. It could be um, cut in half almost. Um, there was quite an uproar among all the school districts in the state because we had no idea that was going to happen. Um, uh, Michelle and I even talked to our local legislators about it. I guess the word got back from some schools that, hey, this looks bad. This looks like a tax increase. Uh, that uh, the, the budget, the PD, was able to transfer money from the CARES Act, the large lump sum money that Pennsylvania got into some of it into this fund. I believe it was about 390 million or something like that. Um, so now we're right back to the homestead farmstead reduction that I reported in May. So it'll be $271 still for all persons. Maybe if you guys could uh, complain about something else and get some money back in. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So the um, the budget reductions that 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 will be that's taken place since the last time we met were one the ten percent reduction in building and some individual other budgets that was incorporated into the expense of television the large decrease in expenses come from personnel changes uh, and then elimination of positions through attrition and uh, I believe Michelle um, handed out or was in. So the enrollment study proved to be our friend, and um, we had a number of resignations, a number of retirements. Um, so the administration and I got to work on saying, okay, um, what do we really need? Um, and I, I think one of the things that it's important for the board to know is that even if we weren't in the current public health emergency that we find ourselves in, um, we'd be using that enrollment study anyway to, to take a hard look at the positions that we need. All right, so I think it's important that um, even though you're seeing a lot of attrition, we are one of the more fortunate school districts in the state that we have the attrition to take, right? That student achievement and the, all the good things that we do for kids remains intact. Right. Um, this is an opportunity to take a hard look at our staffing and say, what do we need? Um, Jeff and I have used this phrase, and actually Jeff is the one who came up with it at the beginning of the year when we started talking about the need for an enrollment study to take a hard look at, at staffing. And it's this concept of what do we need to do to right size us, right size us for the declining enrollment that we see. Right. Um, so what you see there is the beginnings of that. Right? The opportunity to take a hard look. Now, you know, people are very concerned. A lot of people who were close to that retirement, you know, they're taking a look at next year and they're expressing concerns about what it's going to be like to come back and teach. Um, and then some of the challenges also that they've had in the spring, um, you know, a, a lot of our staff decided, you know what, I'm this close, it's time for me to go. Right? The, the challenge that I had this spring and the challenges that we may face in, in the fall, you know, maybe it's a good time for me to reevaluate whether or not I see that challenge as something I really want to take on at this point in time. Okay. Um, and so that's why you're seeing a good bit of the retirement that you see in front of you. And these are, these are positions that we don't need to fill. Okay, now, um, one position I do need to make you aware of um, Roxanne in um, seventh grade math. Um, we have every intention of replacing that position, but I was informed today that there is a teacher over in sixth grade who wants the transfer. Okay, so we are going to allow her to transfer, and you'll see that on the board agenda next week. But one of the things I want you to keep in mind. Um, two weeks ago, if that transfer would have come up, I would have said, okay, we can right size sixth grade to seven classroom deep. Today, I'm saying I'm not confident I want to take that position right now. Reason is, some of the private schools in the area 
are beginning to make decisions about whether or not they want to open in the fall, right? Um, so, and, and so Cheryl Todd and I will begin to watch that, and we're also beginning to get inquiries from our families in the area that are enrolling their kids here, right? Because they're choosing to get out of the private school degree. And so that's something that I know I need to watch for a while, because if you look at the other side of the staffing plan that I gave you, I begin to talk about how many classrooms in each grade that we have. And I'm afraid of that if I cut us too deep, right, if I take too many positions right now, I'm not going to give us the flexibility we're going to need to react to whatever enrollment patterns might occur as a, re so as a result of private schools choosing not to open in the fall, right? So, um, so you see um, some grades that are AP, right, um, some grades that aren't, and what the class size is. And I feel really good about that right now. Um, I know fifth and sixth grade, I could probably take them seven classrooms deep, but I'm choosing not to do that right now because I just don't know what our enrollment is going to look like in the next few weeks due to those schools that may not open in the fall. Okay. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about our kindergarten enrollment at this point? I know you're seeing 115 and only 49 enrollments are confirmed at this point. Um, spring is the busiest time for our kindergarten, our incoming kin kindergarten to be confirmed with us. And of course, we didn't have the ability to meet face-to-face -face and for parents to submit all the documentation that they need to submit. Um, so right, we are at 115 right now. Only 49 of them are confirmed, but when Cheryl Todd and I look at the enrollment study, we are projecting an incoming kindergarten class of anywhere from 150 to 155 kids, right? And so that to us would say, okay, eight deep, right? And that would put that classroom size at about 18 or 19 kids. We believe that low classroom size is going to be really important to us because a lot of those kids were removed from their preschool experience in the spring. And so we're not sure what kind of learning deficit those kids are going to come into us with. And we want to make sure we have a class size that can support catching kids up, right? So I know 115 looks kind of alarming right now, but that's that we don't believe that's the number that we're going to see. What we're hoping is that we are going to be able to give Cheryl Todd a central location. When we're talking about this room, you know, today, and put all those good social distancing protocols in place. So come July 1st, we might be in a position by some type of appointment for those parents to come in and confirm that process with us. She is beginning to get calls, right? But since our campus is still closed, um, you know, we're really hesitant to bring folks in until we have a really good procedure in place, right? Um, and we can do that in a safe way. Uh, something else I need to bring to the board's attention in a conversation with the Octorera Education Association about a week or, a week or so ago. So generally, if you're um, a teacher with us and you're out on FMLA right now, you have to notify me by the last day of the school year about your intent to come back in the fall, right? And so we have a number of staff who are out on FMLA and I've extended the time in which they need to let us know if they plan to be back in the fall. The reason I've done that is these people are really nervous about what kind of daycare they're going to have, right? Um, about whether or not they're even going to be able to secure daycare in the fall. And so, um, you know, the association I said, oh, okay, that's fine. We're happy to work with them, right? If they can't let me know by the last day of school year, which is June 5th, you know, we'll continue to work with them up until about a month before the school year starts. And then they're going to have to confirm with me whether or not they plan to extend their FMLA leave in the fall or whether they're planning to come back. Um, I get the anxiety that they have. I mean, even our own Y here on campus that Jeff and I thought was going to open here in the month of June, um, that curveball a week ago, like, you know, 
four days before, we're in a Zoom room with them, right? And, and we're anticipating that they're going to open up the wide um, little location here on June 15th or somewhere around that time. And then four days later, we're finding out that they're not going to open at all until the fall. And we had no knowledge of that. Um, so I understand our staff's concern about securing daycare and what child care is going to look like in the fall. So I felt it was important to work with them. Um, they have to let me know by the 31st of uh, July. If you have additional retirement, mm -hmm. when would be the point that you think you would be notified? When, when would it end of June? Or could it be any time for you know, three days before the first bus? Well, you know, they kind of the, um, it's hard to tell. I, I was really excited to see the early retirements that we got because that really helped plan. Um, I think a lot of people are waiting. I, I know people are pretty frustrated with the preliminary guidance that has come out from the Pennsylvania Department of Ed. Um, a lot of teachers have had questions for me about whether or not they're going to be teaching from behind glass shields or they're going to have to wear masks or whether we're going to be totally online. Um, it's unfortunate that that preliminary guidance is out because it's not well done. It, it's so, I don't even want to say it's vague. flexible. It's, it's vague, right? And so it's causing a lot of fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And so um, I think folks are going to wait, wait this out. So we have the minimum amount, like what's the amount of time that they have? What's the lead time they're required to give? My understanding, there is no requirement. There is no lead time. So. Um, the only way I, I can hold them, like if they come into my office the first day of school and tell me that they're going to retire, there's really not a whole lot exactly. of time. Like, so we, it them. could be literally two weeks later I'm going to go. Yeah. yeah. Okay. This is going yeah. To be the, and you know, that's where we would go to our sub list or, you know, we would see, you know, how many weeks out were we for the start of school. Okay. Um, you know, the only leverage I have with staff in terms of a resignation is if they're leaving me and going to another school and then you know i can place a hold on them but then even in those cases you know if i look at a teacher who's uh, resigning to take a position in another school district and i say okay i'm going to hold you for the next few months generally with what happens is they just begin to work through their sick days you know so it, it becomes really important for us to find qualified replacement um, so that's a little different this year you know generally we're not talking to the board about what um, our long-term sub needs are but but this one i really felt it was important to put it in front of you because um, one we have a number of people who are going out on child leave next year um, in addition to the the four that were out this spring who aren't sure they're going to be able to return in the fall because of child So the enrollment study was very, very helpful. And I really have to thank the team because um, they got into that right size mode and they said, okay, what is a reasonable class <coughs> based on what our needs are? We're very fortunate. Can you, can you, do, uh, <coughs> can you just clarify the plan for Rock Springing? Yeah, so we have a teacher over in sixth grade. Right who um, wants to transfer into the job, okay? okay? Um, and so we're excited about that. We think she's, she's going to be a really, really good fit, and that's going to be on the agenda next week, okay. okay? So then what I would do is I would say, okay, when I look at the enrollment in sixth grade, do I now need to replace that position, okay? Because right now, sixth grade, or sixth grade is 8D, right? And an 8D is a total of 106, 65 kids. That's 21 kids in a class, right? So I could probably go seven deep with that grade, right? Um, but I'm hesitant to do that right now because as those private schools begin to close, I may need that elementary position some, somewhere else. Like what happens if I see a spike in, in uh, grades three or four? where we're going to take, you 
Mexico, and both of those um, Operera elementary school grades to that seven point seven that remaining scenario. So what you're saying is you're going to leave that position in the budget? Yeah, I would like to leave it now. Once we reach a comfort zone where we have a better handle on the enrollment, sure, I could be coming back to the board and saying, hey, we are not going to fill it. We do not need the position. It's not for a, a math teacher per right. se. Right. Right. So you're saying leave the position open and right. work wherever else you might be a need for it. Right. Okay. Now the sixth grade teacher is moving to math. Right. Right. But we may or may not. We may not fill right. that sixth grade. But we're going to leave it in the budget for now. So are you going to use a long term sub to get a first grade teacher or how do you think? To the sixth grade. Sorry. To the sixth grade. I would need to make a decision by the end of July whether or not sixth grade is going to be seven classroom, eight or eight. Okay. Well, no. You know you'll pop the old mm -hmm. you'll know your population mm -hmm. at that point. Right. Okay. Yeah. So Cheryl Todd and I feel good that by the 31st of July, we should have a really good handle on what those private schools are going to do. Because if they're doing anything, it's now. Which private school do you, are you working um, So it's Sacred Heart in Oxford, and um, we are being, we're beginning to see an increase in parents withdrawing their children from the West Okay. Uh, and we do know that they have a faculty meeting tomorrow and, and there appears to be some collapsing of grades and some sharing of grades. Um, so we're up to our fifth phone call from that school. For the record, I don't take any comfort in any of that. So. I don't. Yeah. Uh, no, I do not take any comfort. That's not what I'm asking. I, yeah. yeah. No, I'm. Um, we're sad to see that because they're both really good schools. But I think too, you know, as, as all schools are having that conversation as they look at that preliminary guidance that's come out from the Pennsylvania Department of Head of Health um, and the Pennsylvania Department of Ed. I know our private schools don't necessarily have to adhere. To everything that the Pennsylvania Department of Education expects us to do, but you know the guidance we're seeing from the Center for uh, Disease Control and the Department of Health, you know, we're all our heads are spinning right now. Like, how do you expect us to do this <laughs> with all of these kids? So, Plus the tuition factor. Plus the label. tuition. Yeah. 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 And plus, too, if those schools struggled in an online environment in the spring, and you know they don't necessarily have the resources that they need in order to be able to make that switch right away if they have to. Um, it's a it's a tough time. I think just the general population is. I think just everybody's head spinning with the current Department of Health regulations, and it doesn't really matter what. What business you're in? I think so. Yeah. And when we're not consistent everywhere in right. how we deal with it, it's um, yeah. it makes it challenging for us. Um, some other items to note about the budget. Uh, budget to budget is actually the expenditures are actually declined by twelve thousand dollars compared to 2019-2020. Uh, so this will have a, uh, actually have a direct effect on our uh, charter school tuition rates next year. So assuming that the average daily membership didn't decline too much, you know, we should see a minimal increase in that charter school tuition uh, for next year. Uh, also on for budget, I wanted to let you know that we have not heard much uh, news on any tax freeze legislation. Uh, we were talking about that about two months ago. There were a couple of bills put out there that would freeze the tax rate. And um, we weren't too worried about them because we were going into this with a 0% tax increase. However, if one of those bills passed and didn't address the rebalancing that schools like us do, we could have been in a situation where we weren't able to rebalance. 
And if we if that happened, we would have lost about eighty-five thousand in revenue. However, there's not much talk about that legislation right now. So I believe that that's probably not going to happen. In fact, many schools have actually um, passed their budget, some with increases. Um, so it seems like uh, we're not really too worried about that right now. And, and so other than that, um, this is what I would like to bring to you next Monday uh, for our final budget for you to vote on. And uh, if there are any other questions about the budget that you have, or if there's any information you want me to bring next Monday, uh, just let me know. The 10% that you mentioned, um, is that inclusive of the position changes? Or was that an additional 10% that the building administrators, like the principals and their assistants, that they were able to squeeze out of there? Yeah, that 10% that budget was uh, building and a couple other programs, uh, reduction in supplies, equipment, things specific to their program. Um, that was incorporated into this budget. It was about the exact dollar amount of the reduction was uh, $58,140. So that, that, that and these position changes are what we've included in the budget since we looked at it last month. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Um, and um, the only other significant item in the 2021 budget that I would like to point out is we continue to have the junior high sports uh, expenditures in there without the revenue from the new school. So if it gets passed now, we would be in complete control of the funding for junior high sports and the new school would not be uh, paying uh, a bill for those sports. All right, so that's uh, all. That's all I have for the budget. Good job. Shut things down. <laughs> the nutrition's and stuff like yeah. that, but I mean, still, we it was a big jump. It was uh, a good time to have an enrollment study in our hands, you know, because yeah. you know you're you're ready here. I, filling all these positions what's going on and you're going to be able to say this is very objective I mean, this is looking at the enrollment study looking at those trends and looking at what, what we need we still have some of the best class size around and, and michael brooks confirmed with me today they work on the master schedule in the junior senior high even in the junior senior high you're looking at class sizes anywhere between 19 and 25 kids so we have some of the best class size now. And, and going into next year, you know, next year could be a pretty a pretty rough year. Um, we know that interest revenue declined quite a bit. We have that in the budget. Um, up up till now, we've seen about an eight percent decrease in our EIT from April May April and May, and I think EIT. Is probably going to decline even more. Um, our transfer tax for March through May was down about 32 percent, and um, uh, delinquent tax collections, even though I think we're going to be fine for this year, we did see a decline budget to budget or month. My monthly budget, we didn't reach that for April, April and May. So going into next year, I think these variable revenues could continue to decline and we might have to look at additional reductions next year. Uh, so this at least get us, gets us to a good starting point and then you know when we start these process again in December we'll have a pretty decent handle on those local revenues. Uh, but what I'm saying seeing right now is not unexpected but it is it, it, it is a little scary how much there is to come. So Jeff when you were mentioning no no uh, nothing pressing on the uh, property for that also uh, I think one of the stuff that came after that was the uh, extensions of discount periods and things like that. Where's that at? 
Yeah, there, there were two different bills for the extension of the pay of, of pay. Uh, one of them, which is not doesn't have a leg right now, would force us to change the due date. There's another bill out right now that, that they could be looking at this week, which would allow you to change those due dates. It, it, I mean, something you can actually do now anyway. If that legislation passes, then we're going to have to have a conversation about do we keep the current collection period or do we extend the fate and the discount in the penalty period. So right now, um, the legislation's proposing penalty goes all the way out to December instead of October. Um, if we were to do something like that, we would be putting on the table about, two, I believe I reported about 280,000 last month of, of uh, penalty revenue. And that's a decision that we'll have to make that legislation could come up this week, and if it does, then uh, we'll, we'll have to talk about that at Monday. But you you can still pass the budget resolution, and then we can adjust the due dates after the fact. So yeah, so we should hear pretty soon about that legislation. Okay, so moving on from budget. See, I'm, I'm, I'm just gonna say my point in that is. I think mean, we'll, we'll be careful about blowing CARES money too soon because that's another instance where you could shift some money from that. We had to and because of the COVID delay you know, or eliminating our penalty phase, right? That's right. two hundred thousand yeah. dollars. But I, I, I prefer that we exercise some caution to how we spend that money. Sure. And I'm, I'm, I'm not doubting you will, but I'm just saying that's a good point. Um, the the other CARES money, the grant, the safety grant, I have not seen the, um, what we're allowed to spend that money on. Um, I don't know, Michelle, if you've seen that. It's long, broad. It's, it's very broad, but I think they're going to begin to be specific here. You know. Um, yeah, because that'll give us between the CARES 490 and that 200 and I say 230, no, 285,000. So that would give us about 770,000. As of right now, we have uh, we have used about 280 of that. So the rest of it, you know, of course, we'll have to talk about well, what to cover, what to go to, and uh, that's a good point. Not only do we have additional expenses, we could have additional losses that that, that somehow could help. So there might be expenses that we've already decided we need to incur. We just cover it with this money, and we don't add to other overall expenses. So that's another way to look at. Okay. So anything else about budget, or should I move on to the next slide? At this point, I feel like the budget is just a crapshoot. I've never felt this confused about what's going to happen next year. All my time on the board. So, I mean, but that. I think next year's going to be the yeah. yeah, I mean, we, we have no clue. Huh? We're passing the budget, but we've got no clue what's going to happen with this. Well, it's funny, is uh, the school district, Kiski School District, they yeah. always said they're going virtual. I know. Right? It was funny when I first saw that. Oh, I can't believe that super is going out getting out in the lead like that. But knowing what's coming out lately, I sort of understand it in a way. Yeah. Well, if you have the resources to do it and your community is okay with it, yeah. You know, yeah. As, as exactly. we look at the remote learning survey that we pushed out to our school community, it's very clear our community they want their kids back in school. You know, so um, like I said, I think it's going to be a local all the way around, but I share that same confusion with all of you, uh, which is why the, the preliminary conversation that Jeff and I have had is using some of the CARES funds to bring help in, to, to hire, um, you know, one of the things that PDE put in their preliminary guidance in the plan is we have to, not only do we have to have a pandemic team, but we have to have somebody to uh, lead it, right? That 
pandemic uh, lead uh, role. And so you look at the entire team and nobody on this team has that expertise, right? So we know we're going to have to bring some type of uh, professional person in to be able to help us with this, just to, just to help us create the plan and then put the plan in, in place. Because we don't know what is a reasonable expectation for kids and staff. And so, can that position be shared with the school district? I was going to say that. Yeah. 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 Well, and that's where work. the state <laughs> come up with the concrete guidelines. For the <laughs> the job description. The pandemic coordinator. So I reached out to George Fiore last week and said, okay, I'm seeing in the guidelines that the district is going to have to have a pandemic coordinator. Tell you right now, there's nobody on my team that has the expertise. Um, would you help us? Help us find somebody who can come in and help us create the plan, lead the team, and more importantly, put the plan in place. So that's the assignment that George Fiore has for us right now. And you're right. Why didn't PDE look at the IU and say there are enough people out there who are trained in healthcare and emergency man management? Right, who could do this for us? Instead, PD just pushes out this preliminary guidance and says, oh, by the way, you're going to have to have a pandemic coordinator and a team. Yeah, I don't even think they have one, right? But that would be an example of what we would use funding from the CARES Act to support that professional resource to come in and help us. And, you know, as far as the team is concerned, that's a good investment because our school community is going to have to have trust and confidence in every decision that you make, right? And so when you have a professional resource come in and help you develop that plan and put that plan in place, that begins to give your school community some hope and some trust that we're just not trying to do this ourselves without any training, any expertise, any background, any experience. We hope to have an update for you next week. Absolutely. <laughs> the more training that needs. I know. <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, next item on the agenda is uh, the municipal account. So a couple years ago, we started talking about um, an online payment system for tax bills, and. Uh, um, I looked into it, but I, we really didn't have a lot of uh, we really didn't have a lot of requests from our taxpayers to make these tax payments um, online or with credit cards. In, in a few taxpayers that I talked to, were actually able to pay through Fulton Bank on a credit card because they have a Fulton Bank credit card. So I've had this information sitting around. Um, you know, I would look at it every now and then. Well. Just recently, uh, the administration uh, has come to me about setting up an account for the credit recovery solution. You want to that one? Credit, yeah, credit recovery solution. Right. Uh, so, so we're trying to make it as easy as possible for people to sign up for the credit recovery through the OBA and any other payments they would have to make through OBA. One, of course, they're not physically here. Two, want to encourage them. You know, to be put as quickly as possible and give them a credit card option. So I had to go ahead and pick a, you know, normally I'd come to you and say, will you approve this vendor? Well, I already had done the footwork. We needed to get this up and running. In fact, we were shooting for today to have it running. It might not happen until tomorrow because there's a little more training that I have to go through. Um, so the company that we're using is Municipay. In Municipay, they handle, uh, uh, Chester County, Chester County, they handle a couple of schools in Lancaster. Um, and out of all the online payment places that I had talked to, their fee was the lowest. So, like, if we have a uh, person that needs to pay a hundred and sixty dollar credit recovery bill, they can do it through an e-check, electronic check, and pay with all the fifty. 
or if they want to use an actual credit card as a credit transaction, they have to pay 2.65%. Most of the other companies charge a little bit higher. They were around 3 and 3.3%. Also, those companies charge the setup fee and an annual fee. Municipate does not. So we went ahead and did what we needed to do to get that account started. So what I'm asking for you is to approve an agenda item allowing us to use municipal pay. And um, as of right now, it would just be the credit recovery. However, we can start looking at that for any kind of payment. You know, if we can get out of the cash collection business in the, the high school and the junior high, that would be great. Um, and then tax payments, of course. You know, every now and then someone will say, you know, I want to get points on my credit card. Can I pay taxes, you know, uh, with a credit card? And I would send them down to the open bank. But now they certainly could do it through the online payment system if they want. It's a big bill if you're paying using your credit card. Again, 3% is a big. But if you use the e-check, um, you know, it's, it's a minimal fee. Uh, do you have any questions about minutes you pay or? So the athletic trainer, uh, we've used API for the last several years for our athletic trainer. Uh, in the uh, winter and spring, we got quotes from API and LGMG, our current, uh, our doctor, the company that our doctor works for. And their athletic trainer fees are, are, are significantly less than API. Again, they want to get their athletic trainers in here. Um, at a fee, I assume, so they can make the relationship with the students and families and the brain building for their practice. So, for the 2021 school year, we would like to uh, not bring API back, but there was the uh, Lancashire, uh, it's LGMG, so that's the official name, but it's the same uh, medical firm that our doctor is from. Their cost would be uh, 43700 per year, uh, and this would include the regular athletic trainer and then the part-time trainer that would help in the um, weight room. Uh, ATI would have charged us 85000 for each. Yes, but if you recall, for several years we did have an agreement with ATI where we only paid them about the same as 25000 I believe that they're getting away from that model, so they're not going to offer up that covering <laughs> uh, discount this year. So, um, so until they don't get the contract, we would uh, uh, like you to approve uh, the agreement with LGMG for the athletic trainer. Uh, we're still working on the language because we're trying to get a. a Clause in there for what happens if uh, the school shuts down. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not going to make an assumption that all the all the certifications are the same. Yeah. yeah. We're going to make a COVID clause in every contract. Yep. Jeff, can we get the two staff? Or do they have to appoint a trainer here? We get the one. It would be our current trainer. It would be our current can I table that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's okay. No, okay. We need a hand signal. <laughs> oh, wait. It's just made on the camera. Do you talk and then I can do that? <laughs> <laughs> you get the interview. Don't call it up. Okay. So that we can. Uh, on the agenda, I had an item for the Off Hills Rehabilitation Services Agreement extension. However, um, we really need uh, to speak our, to our new um, uh, pay uh, Yeah, I've gotten confirmation from him that he would like to continue this agreement, but I really need to speak to him when he's in here so I can get a better handle on on the services and, and, and the agreement that we're asking you to sign. So um, I'm, I'm going to bring that back to you as well. Okay, we kind of talked about the CARES grant.
and the 492,000 uh, that we're getting to spend between this year and next year, uh, part of uh, that money um, we're using for the Chrome pad purchases, and that's to ensure that I, that's paid through through yeah, K, K4. K4, right, for the technology. The rest of that money um, we will sit tight with and then determine what the best use is. Um, you know, the conversation we just had with Brian, you know, there are going to be a lot of expenditures and a lot of things that we don't even know are going to pop up. So the, the rest of that money we're just going to have to sit tight on and then the security grant. The same thing. We don't have anything outlined for that money of it right now. Uh, but within the tariff grant we did spend two hundred and eighty seven thousand. Okay, under other, um, I did want to report out the YMCA will not be opening up their daycare until the fall, but Michelle touched on that. Uh, and then also we have a, a little bit of a uh, change in the tax bill for the 2021 school year. Um, we give taxpayers the option to make three, uh, to make their payments in three installments. Uh, our tax bill never allowed them to do, they had to come in or they had to let us know that they needed those three installment payments. So we've been working on changing the bill so that when the taxpayer gets the bill, they have the regular payment and then they have the three installment payment receipt with them. It should just make it a lot easier for the taxpayer to pay that bill, especially if they're paying um, the installment payments. So um, that's a slight change in how the bill will look. And uh, we're just hoping that uh, uh, you know, the budget is passed on Monday. We don't have any changes in the bill. So we need to go ahead and get that process started. With the tax bill. Um, and that's all I have on my agenda. Is there anything else? That like us to bring, talk about or anything else to bring up. All right. Thank you. Are we using the same agenda for the No. We actually have a few minutes now.